you're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network. This is Agriculture Today. Glad to have you along with us. If African swine fever virus would ever reach the United States, it could cause more than $16.5 billion in economic losses to the hog production industry and other segments of the food production sector, potentially devastating trade and international markets for U.S. pork. A team of researchers out of the College of Veterinary Medicine at K-State and the Animal Sciences and Industry Department here at the university are taking scientific measures to hopefully prevent that from happening. This team is led by an assistant professor of diagnostic medicine and pathobiology, Megan Niederwerter, and she reminds us of the background on African swine fever and the devastation that it has already racked up elsewhere in the world. African swine fever virus, or commonly known as ASF, is a highly contagious viral disease of swine. And since 2007, African swine fever virus has been introduced and spread in Eastern Europe as well as Russia. And because of this introduction and spread, the risk of introduction to other countries that are negative for the virus, such as the United States, has really heightened. And ASF is a significant animal agricultural threat, uh, not only because it causes high mortality in pigs, it's also highly contagious, and there are several concerns with regards to disease control, including a lack of an effective vaccine, as well as the potential for ASF to become endemic in both soft ticks as well as feral swine. So the reason African swine fever virus would be so economically devastating to swine production in the United States is not only because in large scale the current mitigation strategies are focused on culling infected animals, so there would be a devastating loss of animals, but there would also be a devastating loss in both trade uh, to international markets because of the presence of that disease in the U.S. Now, it's important to stress up front that African swine fever does not infect humans, so it's no threat in that respect. However, again, as Megan says, the economic fallout from an ASF outbreak would be monumental. So the research that she and her colleagues have embarked upon now was actually inspired by the series of events that led to the spread of the PED virus which wreaked havoc in the swine industry starting several years ago. The last major transboundary animal disease that was introduced into the United States swine herd was PEDV, or porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, in 2013. Within the first year that PEDV was introduced, approximately 10% of the U.S. swine herd, or 7 million pigs, died due to this disease. After it was introduced, there were several epidemiological investigations that revealed the risk of feed as a possible route for introduction of PEDV into the U.S. Once we understood that feed was a risk for PEDV, uh, it became inherent that we needed to understand the risk of other foreign animal diseases such as ASF virus or African swine fever virus being introduced through feed and feed ingredients. There are millions of pounds of feed ingredients that are imported into the United States every year. And as those feed ingredients are imported from other countries with potentially other diseases, there's a risk that a virus could be introduced through one of these feed ingredients that's imported. So Megan is collaborating with K-State's Biosecurity Research Institute here on the campus to continue studying the risk of African swine fever virus in feed and feed ingredients. She's looking at the entire swine feed transport cycle from the shipment of feed as it is imported to the U.S. to when swine consume feed on the farm. And the reason that we want to understand the risk of African swine fever virus being introduced in feed or feed ingredients is one, because we now know that feed could have played a role in the introduction of PEDV, but also because of the significance of African swine fever virus and the significant economic effect that ASF virus would have on swine production in the U.S. 
And so the focus of this project has really been understanding the risk of ASF and feed and feed ingredients, as well as understanding how do we mitigate this risk. And it's really been based around three objectives. The first objective is to understand if the virus survives in feed and feed ingredients using a transboundary model. That's used to simulate the shipment of feed ingredients from other countries in a trans-oceanic voyage from, let's say, Eastern Europe or Russia into the United States. So we look at, does African swine fever virus survive in those feed ingredients using fluctuating temperature and humidity values based on historical meteorological data and to see if the virus would survive at the end of that trans-oceanic voyage. The second objective is to look at the minimum and median oral infectious dose of African swine fever virus through natural feeding behavior. So the reason we want to look at the oral infectious dose of ASF through natural feeding behavior is because once we determine if ASF survives in the feed ingredients, we really need to know does it survive at a dose that would then subsequently be infectious to pigs. So we may learn that ASF survives in the feed ingredients but it's so low that it's non-infectious to pigs. So the next step of that project is really to understand what's the oral infectious dose. And the third objective is to understand how we can mitigate this risk. So are there additives that we can put in feed or feed ingredients that inactivate the virus and mitigate the risk of ASF being transmitted and introduced through these feed ingredients? This research is being performed in a biosafety level 3 laboratory at the Biosecurity Research Institute. They've been studying 5 gram amounts of complete feed and feed ingredients. We have a panel of several feed ingredients as well as products of animal origin that we have been testing uh, with African swine fever virus. And those were based on what's commonly imported into the United States and then what feed ingredients actually go into swine feed. And so we look at these ingredients at a very standardized amount, so it's a five gram amount. Uh, so we have small quantities, and then we look at how the virus survives in those small quantities after being housed in an environmental chamber, which really simulates that transboundary shipment model with fluctuating uh, temperature and humidity. So examples include lysine, dried distillers grains, uh, choline, vitamin D, pork sausage casings are some of the ingredients that we use in our model. For specifics, the researchers are placing these ingredients in 50 milliliter tubes in an environmental chamber, and then they program that chamber's temperature and humidity, which would mimic a cargo ship's journey from Eastern Europe to North America. That's a model that simulates travel from Eastern Europe over 30 days' time. Then they'll study if the virus is still present at a dose infectious to pigs after that simulated shipment, and if there are any additives that might actually stop the virus from spreading through feeding. So for the mitigation tools, we're looking at what additives could be incorporated into feed to inactivate the virus. Examples of these include medium chain fatty acids as well as formaldehyde. Now, because of the extensiveness and the complexity, this is a multi-stage project. But Megan notes that progress is already being made. We have completed Objective 1 and started presenting that research at uh, symposiums. The most recent one was the North American PERS Symposium held in Chicago in December. These projects are currently ongoing and we anticipate uh, results uh, within a year. The ultimate goal of the project is to understand what mitigation tools can be utilized to reduce the risk of African swine fever virus being introduced through these mechanisms, whether that be done at the country of origin or once it arrives in the United States. In addition to feed mitigants, we are also investigating time factor. Is there a time factor that's introduced as far as the length of time needed for the virus to be inactivated? 
Once we're able to understand what mitigation tools can be used to mitigate African swine fever virus in these feed and feed ingredients, additional studies will be done to understand what dose of the mitigant is necessary, the timing of application, and the length of efficacy for each mitigant. This entire project, by the way, is being supported financially by the National Pork Board, the Swine Health Information Center, and the State of Kansas National Bio and Agro-Defense Facility Fund. As they study the risk of African swine fever carried in feedstuffs and practical means of counteracting that risk. Spearheading this work, Megan Niederwerder, Assistant Professor of Diagnostic Medicine and Pathobiology in the College of Veterinary Medicine here at Kansas State University. We'll be back with more in a moment. You're listening to Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Welcome back. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Every year, the Department of Agronomy at Kansas State University welcomes in an accomplished plant scientist to present at the Elmer G. Heine Lecture here at the university. That is in honor of the longtime and renowned wheat breeder here at Kansas State for many a year, Elmer Heine. This time around, they have brought an individual in from a prominent seed company that uh, you'll be familiar with here in the U.S. He's a senior research scientist with DuPont Pioneer, Dr. Charlie Messina. And he's going to visit about one of the things he's really striving for in his work, and that is the marriage, if you will, of plant science and all of this data that technology allows us to collect these days in crop production. Charlie, first of all, welcome to K-State. Thank you very much. It's an honor. You're from South America originally, correct? Yeah, I was born in, in Buenos Aires. Uh, my parents uh, farm in northern Argentina. I'm familiar with the challenges that farmers face every year. Uh, there's a drought area, it's a semi arid area where I cut on my teeth as agronomist, and uh, that was a strong motivation to be part of a company that seeks to develop products to help farmers. And what is your specific role as a senior research scientist with DuPont Pioneer? I'm today a member of a group called Predictive Agriculture, led by John Arbuckle. What we seek to do is develop prediction methodologies to enhance the efficiency of the breeding programs. The objective, of course, is increase genetic gains, develop more drought-tolerant material, but also develop methodologies that, using the same prediction, we can inform how to manage those products. Uh, So accelerating that learning cycle that farmers has to go through every time we release a new hybrid, if they know how to work with it, the faster they can realize that entitlement for their payment uh, for for that bag of seed. Mm -hmm. So what sort of predictive mechanism do you and your team use to foretell the future, if you will, of how well a certain seed line might perform and what challenges it might face? Very interesting question. Uh, we think about prediction in two ways. One, as you say, is forecasting. For, for that, we don't know the future. We don't know the weather. But we can help farmers make strategic decisions in terms of how much corn, how much soybeans, how much wheat they can plant. They can also make tactical decisions given a particular year, perhaps is how much irrigation, one, depending on the plant populations, if you will. The other one is about uh, organized thinking for building the science that we built into those products. For example, the water conservation uh, mechanism that makes Aquamax, right? Instead of using the water to produce biomass, it's a more balanced way of producing the factory 
to fill the kernels and produce the yield and use more water to produce the yield in the end, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's trying to balance that use of the, the valuable resource here in Kansas as, as, such as water. The models we, we create are, are, are biologically based, so okay. they integrate all the biology that we know, uh, years of crop scientists an agronomist uh, all over the country putting together. So we're trying to synthesize that and use the molecular genetic information to bring aspects that are unique to the different hybrids. And the weather uh, builds on top of that to simulate, if you will, what may happen for these different varieties in different parts of the state, if you will, or different parts of the United States. So integrating all that knowledge with the science it's, it's a very exciting. And that is the theme of your presentation for the Elmer Heine Lecture. As you say, integrating all of this data that we are capable of collecting with the technology that's at hand into the actual science of developing crop plants. What are the obstacles that you're taking on here? Probably many. <laughs> <laughs> it's not myself. This is a really team effort. If, if I may, I, I would like to recognize uh, people like Frank Techno and Tom Tank and Mark Cooper, uh, who were part of that team that uh, shaped the vision for how we can start putting this together. I, I think this the motivation to bring this to, to this lecture and cancers is to invite others to contribute and evolve it. Uh, th this is not the end. This is just real the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, we foresee students taking this and evolve it into something which is much, much greater. In layman's terms, how would you describe that model? How does it work? And it does revolve around corn genetics, you say. It, it includes the, the corn genetics, yep. It's the marker information, the genetic makeup that we can see through the lens of these molecular marker technologies. And the crop model encapsulates, uh, it's your virtual agronomist. That's what it is. Think about, you are putting to talk a virtual agronomist with your virtual breather. Maybe that's <laughs> as simple as you can think of. When you look at all the data, what kinds of data seem to have the most value here as you bring all of this together? The, the key to all this is the breeding foundation. We need to have breeding trials which are of high quality, w without which uh, th there's nothing you can do, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's uh, the, the work that the breeders are doing. Similar, the, the agronomy work is also important, but that foundation, breathing foundation, is what is key to be able to learn from that data. Mm -hmm. If we don't have good quality data, we can't learn anything from it. So is all data valuable? Is all data equal <laughs> in that respect? I think it, you can think about yield is probably what we, we seek to have the highest quality. is mm -hmm. the most difficult to collect. And it's what the farmers are seeking to maximize. Well, the, it's the profit, but it's tightly tied to, to yield. The producers know probably better than anybody that uh, this is the, the end of a road, right? And mm. along that journey, there are many steps and many environmental challenges and well, management decisions and insect pressure that uh, will affect that final outcome. So that's why is the, I think this is the one of the most difficult because too many things can go wrong to generate that high quality data that we can use then to, to have a conversation or we can interrogate using our virtual breeder and virtual agronomist. There are so many moving parts to this field, of course. What's the most exciting thing immediately on the horizon in this area, do you think? I think it's the ability to integrate the many different flows of data sets that we can generate, but with purpose. I, I think is is the product is is it's our mission, right? Mm -hmm. And and be able to build a system that help us do that integration with the expectation that we can maintain or accelerate that genetic gain for them to get better product consistently. And do you think that that that's, integration that's exciting? Is, yeah, is it's it exciting part. is it fully attainable? <laughs> Uh, I think I think so. Uh, the the evidence that we we are seeing uh, suggests that this is a path that we we should uh, proceed. It, it builds on successes of molecular breeding, which that does some. But the, the genetic gain in corn is it, it's evidence for for that. And then I think 
another exciting piece is we can apply some of these learnings to other crops. The, the world is not just uh, corn. Well, presumably this area has come a long way since you started in this field, has it not? Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, indeed. Many years ago we were running or interrogating these genomes uh, one market at a time, one genetic maker at a time. Now we, we have data streams uh, for it. We, we have data flows from drones, uh, from imaging technologies, mm-hmm. and, and now is more biology is, is a producer at an exponential way, so integrating is a challenge and it's exciting. It sounds like it's just now scratching the surface of the possibilities. I think we're just scratching the surface. Yeah. Appreciate you being here on the K-State campus and just sharing your thoughts at the lecture at the university in the agronomy department. And Charlie, the best as you continue forwarding this work for it's truly amazing where we've been and where we're going in the area of crop genetics. Appreciate your time. Thank you and pleasure and honor to be part of this lecture series. He's Dr. Charlie Messina. Senior Research Scientist for DuPont Pioneer, and he talked about, as the title reads, the fusion of the crop growth models and statistical learning, basically meaning how to put together our plant science capabilities with all of that data, the big data that we're able now to collect in production agriculture, specifically in crop production. He's come up with a novel method of integrating genomic information, environmental data, and biological knowledge to predict the performance of new corn hybrids. That's what he's talking up during his visit here. Charlie presented the 2018 Elmer G. Heine Lecture here at Kansas State University this week. You are tuned to Agriculture Today. After this break, we'll be back our weekly horticulture segment for this week, where we'll get an update on likely insect pest problems to turn up in our home landscapes as we enter the month of April. All that is still ahead here on the K-State Radio Network. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Coming your way now on Agriculture Today, our weekly K-State horticulture segment and uh, the season turning now more toward what we're accustomed to as spring-like weather. And so too will we see an increasing number of insect troubles that may show up in lawn and garden. And we'll take on those first arrivals, if you will, of this season now with Raymond Cloyd joining us, horticultural entomologist with K-State Research and Extension. One thing that you've been contemplating, you say, Raymond, is our generally dry weather, although some rainfall of late, but we're still in droughty conditions in Kansas. And How would that potentially relate to insect problems in uh, landscapes and gardens? Yeah, that's a good question, Eric. And, you know, we, we haven't got a lot of moisture overall until recently. And so a lot of the trees are in a state of water stress which puts them in a state of uh, stressful conditions. They're not healthy. Mm -hmm. And many of you wood-boring insects tend to hone in or attack those types of trees because the trees and shrubs cannot defend themselves. So that's why we recommend deep watering right now and then putting mulch uh, will also help. Prefer will be an organic mulch or wood-type mulch, not a a plastic mulch. But that will at least uh, provide some alleviation for dry weather or the lack of rainfall we've had. Because if we continue to get low amounts of water, let's say, then we will run into more problems with wood-boring insects. Those plants cannot defend themselves. Just to further illustrate here, this is a wide assortment of wood-boring insects? Yeah. There, well, we have wood-boring beetles, which would include like the bronze birch borer, the flat-headed apple tree borer, cottonwood borer, and then we have wood-boring caterpillars. And the one that we should be look out for next month is the lilac ash borer. Mm-hmm. It, is a, it is a lepidoptera caterpillar borer, clear wing borer, and the females will come out in April. They'll lay their eggs on the bark. 
those eggs will hatch, the larvae will crawl in to lilac grass trees, and, and they'll get in there and they'll start cutting off the plant's ability to take up water nutrients. And that's why we recommend in early April applying like a pyrethroid insecticide. Permethrin is one of the, uh, the active ingredients as a barrier treatment uh, because most pyrethroids are very good on Lepidoptera. So in early April, and our newsletter will have that information. We'll talk at the end about the, you know, be aware of the lilac or ash borers are flying and you need to get something to protect your trees or you'll have these wood boring larvae in there cutting off the plant's ability to take up water and nutrients. So one, in the case of the lilac ash borer, would want to act fairly early in April, you're thinking? Well, again, it depends on environmental conditions. Yeah. Uh, if we start, if you know, if we get warm weather from here on out, it will exasperate the life cycle. If it stays cool, then it'll slow down. So probably the best bet is to uh, look at our newsletter or call our office, uh, Department of Entomology, and get guidelines from one of our extension entomologists. Eastern tent caterpillars, they will, if they haven't already, will be making their presence known soon, you say, Raven? They will. Uh, uh, I've been watching trees are budding out, and of course, they will they'll have those nests in the crotches of a cherry or apple, anything in the rosaceae family. And the problem with eastern tent caterpillars, when the leaves come out, they're just feeding on them. So they really can have a substantial, significant impact on the health of a young tree or even an older one, because they, by removing the leaves, the plant can't manufacture food by means of photosynthesis. So if you see those nests out there, take a rake or, or a force of water spray and just blast them off. And any birds in the area will probably eat the caterpillars. And we've talked of this before, but that mechanical removal is preferable to any kind of treatment because uh, you can readily take care of these without investing in an insecticide, right? That would be my recommendation, mainly because the sprays are their contact. So it's just easier to disrupt that nest and, and let the birds take over at that point. And at that point, once they're removed, then the plants will then leaf out. Mm -hmm. And will there be a second round of eastern tent caterpillars once you've rid of the first go-round? Well, generally in Kansas, we have about one generation per year at this point. Uh, okay. If it's warmer, it might be two, but as far as I remember, it's about one generation. So if you see those tents start to build up on those trees, well, take steps accordingly and to get rid of those caterpillars as swiftly as possible. Also, as nicer days become more prevalent, Raymond, you'd like folks simply to discourage all kinds of damaging insect potentials out there by cleaning up around the lawn and garden. Oh, absolutely, Eric. Sanitation is the first line of defense. And that includes removing weeds when they start coming up, removing any debris from vegetable gardens or anywhere. Where these are areas where insects can overwinter. Uh, and then, you know, pruning, removing what I call the dead disease and damage, the three Ds. And that allows air circulation, but, you know, that just cleans up the plants and promotes new growth and doesn't provide areas where insects can start an invasion. So sanitation is critical. I mean, you can spray, but if you're not, you're not implementing good sound sanitation practices, it's not going to work very well for you. And though trees, shrubs, other woody ornamentals are budding in some cases right now. It doesn't hurt to uh, conduct some of this light pruning. No. Again, it'll provide good air circulation, mm -hmm. but those branches, if they're dead and damaged and dying, are provide nothing, no benefit to the plant. So scout through your plant material and see where that kind of pruning might be of benefit. And you can actually see it better because of the plants that are leafing out or budding out. The ones that aren't, you might want to cut off. Yeah, yeah. You'll know fairly readily. Yeah. <laughs> right. Now, Raymond, as we're getting into the spring now, the information provided through various means out of K-State Research and Extension will be building up. There'll be quite a volume out there, including the weekly newsletter that can enlighten folks on such insect troubles as they might arise in lawn and garden, and you'd like folks to take full advantage of that. Absolutely, Eric. Uh, I think next month we'll be kicking off the uh, the newsletter, the Extension Entomology newsletter. You can uh, call our office to get a free subscription, and we have a number of uh, Extension Entomologists, including myself, to provide timely information about what to be on the lookout for. Um, we also have a diagnostician. If you have questions, you can send samples. And we have a plethora of fact sheets, extension publications that are available online on our website that people can download. And if they have a trouble with squash bugs or other bugs, they can just download one of those as a PDF and read all about it. And it's as easy as going to entomology.ksu.edu? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
and there's a link to extension there, and that'll right. take you right to the and newsletter us, and the other resources. Yes, in our fa- extension publications, correct, yeah. Very good. Well, the activity ought to be <laughs> ramping up here very soon with the warmer weather. As far as insects in our horticultural plantings go, so homeowners, gardeners, take full advantage of that information as it is available to you. And Raymond, likewise, we'll have you back, Mike, side soon as well to catch up on the latest in lawn and garden insect activity. Thanks for now. Oh, always look forward to it, Eric. Thank you very much. He is Raymond Cloyd, horticultural entomologist, K-State Research and Extension. Again, those resources at entomology.ksu.edu. That is this week's K-State Horticulture segment. And we'd like to remind you one more time before we go that to listen to the podcast version of this broadcast, go to agtoday.net. Or if you'd rather use a podcast app on your mobile device, you can type in the keywords Agriculture Today, Kansas, and you will find the podcast. Just tap the subscribe button there. We'd invite you to take advantage of that listening option. Meantime, Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.